Hello. I'm going to try doing this again. I just tried to do it, and I tripped all over my words. Um, anyway, this is about oh, 20 after 11, and I've got my kids kind of settled uh, since the coronavirus. I don't know about you guys, but since coronavirus, my kids have their days and nights mixed up. They weren't great sleepers before, and now they don't have to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go to school. And mom's usually up late doing work stuff, so... Um, yeah, they are, it's lucky if I can get them to bed by 2 o'clock. So, got them settled. So, if you hear them in the background, you'll see my dogs running around. We got two of the dogs upstairs with my 17 year old. This other one kind of keeps walking around. My son's waving to you guys if you can't see him. Or, obviously, you can't see him. But, so, it's as settled as I can get this house. Um, so, anyways, I wanted to get the renal and the urinary system out to you guys. Uh, the first slide, um, going in the notes, there's a lot of stuff that we'll go over further in um, in the PowerPoint. So I kind of wanted to skip some of this, most of this stuff, actually. I wanted you guys to review the, um, the, a, the an a and P of the kidney. Um, I do have a kidney that I do that I have to find back. I'm going to scan it and put it up on our page um, just to kind of show, give you guys an idea of the makeup of the kidney. Um, but anyways, there's a lot of things that's, that our kidneys do. Our kidneys can filter our blood, um, can remove waste, and extra water, um, can hold on to water, um, control blood pressure, uh, make, make hormones, and excrete them so that our body stays in homeostasis. Um, it can, what's the word I want to use? It produces erythropoietin um, in response to low um, oxygen levels like we talked about with the red bone marrow and the musculoskeletal unit. The um, red bone marrow re releases the red blood cells. Well, it's because the kidneys are releasing the erythropoietin and signaling the bone marrow to release the RBC. So they all work together in some weird way. Um, we just got to figure out which way, how it works together. Um, when kidneys aren't working, all these wastes that the, that the body needs to get rid of actually build up in the skin. Um, there's, or in the body. For our like chronic kidney people, the ones that are on dialysis or just before they start dialysis, see something it's called uremic frost where their skin almost looks dusty um, or crystals um, but most of all they itch. Itch, itch 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 and they cannot get rid of the itch so if the kidneys aren't working they're building everything up and I don't know if you've ever um, cared for somebody that um, is in dialysis my wake-up call I'll have to tell you guys once we get further in here once we start talking about dialysis, but I had a really big wake up call. I was a pretty naive young LPN. Um, and I actually had a patient school me pretty good and happened to be my boyfriend's grandma. Um, so yeah, I, I'll tell you guys that story. My learning, my learning curve, I call it. <laughs> All right. So kidney function, it processes urine. Um, so that blood volume, pH of blood, and tissue fluid, um, the normal composition all kind of stays the same. Um, like I said, the kidneys can either let go or hold on to water, and it can pull that water out of the blood volume. Um, so if somebody is going into hypovolemic shock, the kidneys are going to work to get work and try and hold on to extra fluids and keep that blood volume up. Um, Electrolyte balance, it, moder it really tries to keep, this, especially the sodium and the potassium are the huge ones that we think of, um, tries to keep all of that balanced. Um, remember, when you're learning about sodium and potassium, or sodium, sodium, or water follows sodium, so where the salt goes, the water goes. If the kidney is excreting a lot of sodium, then it's going to excrete a lot of water. Or if it's holding on to sodium, it, their body's going to hold on to the water. So remember, sodium. Where sodium goes, where salt goes, water goes. Um, we'll get into GFR further down. Um, 
acid base balance. Um, when the body is acidic, the kidneys are going to get rid of hydrogen ions um, and put more bicarb ions um, back into the blood. So that makes it, um, it'll raise the pH of the blood so it'll be more alkaline, but it'll return it. I mean, so that trying to get more alkaline in there um, so that the the pH can be back to normal. So it's not acidic anymore. And the same is true in the back way. If, if the foods are too alkaline, um, they're going to... <laughs> hey! Um, but if the kidneys or the, the fluids are too alkaline, um, they're going to put more hydrogen ions in the blood and get rid of more bicarb ions um, to lower the pH so that the fluids are more um, acidic. Oh, what else? Um, I think we, we talked about erythropoietin. Um, a lot of people that we see with kidney disorders um, are going to be anemic. Um, we're going to be giving them erythropoietin shots. Uh, so, like I said, when, when a body is hypoxic or has a low oxygen saturation, um, <coughs> it's going, the kidneys are going to secrete more, more of this erythropoietin. So then it's going to tell the red bone marrow um, to up the RBC so that there can be more red blood cells floating around in the blood to carry more oxygen. So it kind of corrects the whole body. Um, one other note here is we're always preaching at our patients that if they if their um, calcium is low, we want them to take vitamin D. They actually take do have a calcium and vitamin D pill that they take um, because we're saying the vitamin D will help them um, absorb the calcium. Um, but that's because the kidneys are going to convert that vitamin D to what's called um, calcitriol, um, and that is what makes the body um, absorb more of that calcium in the small intestines. So it does a whole, the kidneys do a whole lot of stuff and it's just trying to keep them out straight. I just kind of want you guys to get the um, basis of it um, so that you can understand every, all the cool things that the kidneys do. I am just going to pause this here for a minute. All right, sorry about that, guys. Thought I had everything settled and my dog had to go out. All right, so we're gonna talk about um, urine. Our goal is that we want our patients to have either 1,000 to 2,000 mLs out per 24 hours. Rule of thumb is if your patient is not secreting or urinating, um, whether they have, usually it's measured with a catheter, but an average of 30 cc's per hour there's problems with their um, kidneys. So we want them to have 30 cc's out per hour. Um, we talk about specific gravity. Um, specific gravity is what I'm talking about when I'm saying it's um, more acidic, um, or no, it has to be between 1.010 and 1.0125. This just tells us, um, how the kidneys are able to concentrate the urine. Um, and it also measures what's in the urine, like um, more dissolved material, um, less dissolved material. Um, so example, a high specific gravity above 1.030 um, is generally, there's more dissolved material in there. So our, it means, that they might be de dehydrated. Um, that could be caused by like diarrhea or emesis. Um, maybe they're sweating a whole lot. So a lot of the fluids have gone out. Um, and it can also mean that there's less blood flow to the kidneys. So when there's a low specific gravity, um, we're thinking there's, there's more fluid in there than there is uh, materials. So when we think of like diabetes insipidus, which we'll get into in another um, unit, um, or these people that drink five, six, seven, eight liters of water a day, 
um, where they've got so much fluid intake that it's actually just flushing everything out. Then we go to pH. <clears throat> it's basically measured um, between 4.6 and 8. It can go higher, it can go lower, but average is 6.0. Um, anything under 7 is considered more acidic, um, and anything above 7 is considered more alkaline. So um, a vegetarian diet, it says here that there will be more um, acidic because they're taking in more protein. Um, and a more alkaline diet um, can happen when um, the urine's been standing, like we take it for a urine sample, and it doesn't get refrigerated, and it just kind of sits, or sometimes it can mean that there's an infection, um, or maybe even, um, yeah, so you guys get it. Sorry, my notes are all over the place on these things. So in urine, there's about 95% water. The other things that we see in there are urea, creatinine, and uric acid. Those will all make sense when we start talking about labs. Um, like I said, I'm going to get into labs a totally different way than going through the slides. I will touch on the slides on all of that, but um, I want to make sure. Hold on, I got to quiet my kid down. All right. Um, so urea um, is formed by the liver when there's um, when amino acids are met metabolized um, for energy. Um, I have it written down from here. So the liver excretes um, ammonia, which includes nitrogen. Um, that combines with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen and that forms urea, the waste product. Um, from there, it'll travel to the kidneys to be filtered. The kidneys will filter that urea and take all the waste products out and then excrete it in the urine. Um, creatinine is metabolized by the muscles. I should say creatine is metabolized by the muscles and formed into creatinine and excreted out of the kidneys. And then uric acid um, comes from nucleic acids um, and break down of some of the other body fluids. So when we have a high uric acid or hyperuricemia, um, this can actually cause what's called gout. Some of you guys have heard it before. It's generally um, in the big toe. It is further down here in the notes. Um, when a person is healthy, uric acid is excreted out, out in the urine. Um, but when they are prone to gout, have chronic gout or even acute gout attack, this uric acid it stays in the blood and then settles generally in a joint, most commonly the big toe. Just going over some of my notes here. Um, creatinine, like I said, we'll get into it a little bit later, but what I do want to repeat more than once um, is creatinine is the, the measure of the creatinine in the blood is the best indicator of kidney function. It, creatinine will only elevate when the kidneys are functioning poorly. Other labs that look at kidney function, like the BUN, there's other causes for an increased BUN. But a creatinine will not increase for anything other than poor functioning kidneys. Um, let me just double check what I want to hear or what I want to see. Yeah, I 
I think that's everything I want to say on that one. Um, my notes talk about gout. All right. If you guys are going through this and have questions, please let me know. I'm uh, my notes are all over the place on these, so if you have specific questions, please email me and ask them, or ask to set up a Zoom and we can go over it. Um, all right. So geriatrics. Generally, um, the older you get, the more common it is to have kidney issues. So by age 70 to 80, um, nephrons decrease by 50%, and that's when um, some of these kidney tests will actually start to show kidney, um, poor kidney function or kidney failure. Um, I did find in the book that it said that every decade, the um, blood flow to the kidneys actually de decreases by 10%. I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, all right, so going back and looking at um, the A&P, the kidney, um, you'll see that the nephrons are the actual like structural and functional part of the kidneys. Um, so we really need these to work as, as, as much as they can for as long as they can. Um, but the older a person gets, the number actually decreases. Um, and so the GFR, the glomerular, I can't say it, glomerular filtration rate will decrease. I do have some slides, like I said, coming up, and I feel like I'm saying it's coming up a lot, but I wanted to make sure that this is organized and you guys can understand it. But um, the GFR will decrease um, because there's decreased blood flow to the kidneys. Um, the patients, as they get older, the bladder muscles will weaken, um, the bladder size and the tone um, will decrease, um, so the bladder will be smaller, um, it's not as easy, able to hold the urine as well as it was when they were 20 and before children. Um, so a lot of times you're going to see in the geriatrics that they're um, urinating a lot more. Um, if you work, have worked in a nursing home, you'll know that they're on basically a two-hour toileting schedule. Um, generally upon awakening, before meals, after meals, um, and then before bedtime. Um, it kind of equals out to about every two hours. Um, they might have more urinating at night, the nocturia, um, just because their body is just making more urine and filtering it more at night. Um, they might actually have residual urine sitting in their bladder when they get older because they're not able to empty their bladder anymore because they're not able to use that muscle like they once did when they were younger. Um, so that leaves them at a huge, huge risk for UTIs, um, urinary tract infections. Um, for, for many reasons, their decreased ability to um, concentrate their urine. Um, they have urine urgency. We'll talk about um, incontinence coming up. Um, they might, and they might have nocturia or nocturnal polyuria. Just want you guys get familiar with these words. Um, they might actually excrete the meds slower than they once did. So maybe they were 60 when they started on. A blood pressure med, we'll say metoprolol. Well, now they're 80 and their nephrons have decreased by 50%, um, so they're not able to filter and excrete all of it. So maybe it's when they were 60, they were on 200 milligrams, which is a high dose, by the way. So when they get to be 80, maybe they need to be on 50 or 100 milligrams, just because they're not able to excrete it and those meds can actually build up and become toxic. Um, 
can cause overdose symptoms. You know, maybe their blood pressure is tanking all the time and can't figure out why. Well, it's because their kidneys aren't working anymore and their metoprolol is at the same dose it was when their kidneys were working fine. Um, so they might um, have, might need lower doses when they get older. Um, one thing that the notes don't really talk about is males uh, with their prostates. Um, prostates actually enlarge as they get older. So between having a t uh, poor uh, detrusor muscle um, to start the urine, where it's not working as well as it once was, they've also got this prostate that's enlarging and causing a blockage. Um, so they're not able to start their urine stream as much as easy as they were before their prostate enlarged. So there's a lot of things that come into play when these people get old um, just to try and get their urinary system to work. Oh, I just ate a bug. <laughs> it was in my drink. Um, all right. And that is all I have for geriatrics. Oh, bright red, I missed it. The older a person gets, the closer we need to monitor their creatinine and their bun levels. Um, this will continue to tell us what their kidneys are doing. And it's a very simple test. So a lot of times, these are the tests that are run to make sure things are working and done first to see if they are thinking there's an issue. So. All right, labs. So um, the labs are kind of all over the place. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the lab um, on the PowerPoint, and then I'm going to switch over to this website that I found that is amazing. Um, and it will really help you guys in every um, class that you take and in clinicals because it will tell you when we do this test, um, what we're looking for, why we're doing it. Um, you guys will see it. It's really awesome. But all right. So your um, analysis. This is what we are looking for a UTI. Um, they honestly do not need a whole lot. Um, they prefer 10 mLs, but if you can only get a few dribbles, send it to the lab and see if they can take it. Uh, just depends on if a person has urinary retention um, or um, what. Hold on, I gotta pause again. Okay, uh, I apologize for all of this. All right. So your analysis, like I said, they really want you to try and get 10 mLs, but if you only get a couple dribbles, then that's what you get. You need to try. Um, we don't want it to sit at room temperature. If we can't get it to the lab or run the results right away, um, it needs to be refrigerated. Um, if we don't refrigerate it, um, bacteria could grow in it. Um, the pH could actually change, um, and the red blood cells could actually start to break down. And so it can cause some, some abnormal results that aren't really there. Um, UAs can be collected at any time, um, but for best results, we want them to be taken in the early morning, the first void of the day. Um, if you go in for you know, to see if you do have a UTI, um, and you're having symptoms, they're going to take the urinalysis right there. But if there's a chance that you can wait till morning and get the first void, um, that is actually better than just taking it whenever. Um, so right now I'm going to switch over to lab tests online. And 
look up your analysis. So, this will give you everything um, that you need for the lab. Um, so it tells you urine is produced by the kidneys. Yep, we know that. We know what our kidneys are. Um, we've gone over all that. Um, things that we're looking at in the urinalysis, um, glucose, protein, bilirubin, blood cell, red blood cells, white blood cells, crystals, bacteria. Um, generally, it will be, these will show up um, when there's a UTI or kidney disease. Um, See here um, says one to two ounces, so that's 30, 30 mLs to 60 mLs. Um, but you can just test a very small amount. Um, here again, it states first morning sample um, may be requested because it's more concentrated and will it's more likely to detect the an abnormalities. Ugh, I can't talk. Um, might be a clean catch, uh, might be a sterile catch, um, or might be a catheter. Um, just kind of depends on uh, what they want it for. Um, so, let me test is used, like I said. Um, when is it ordered? Um, routine exam, um, when they might be admitted to the hospital. Um, anytime somebody's going to have surgery, they're going to run a urinalysis, a pregnancy um, checkup, they'll run it just to make sure there isn't a UTI. Um, could be that the patient's complaining of symptoms of a UTI um, or like kidney disease. So there could be abdominal pain, back pain, painful frequent urination, blood in the urine, change in level of consciousness, um, flank pain, like pain where the kidneys are. Um, And this is not telling, this is not breaking down. Oh, there it is. That's what I was looking for. So this is kind of a sample report. Um, so the color is measured in a urinalysis. We want that yellow. Um, appearance, we want it clear. So we want it a clear yellow. Um, it could be hazy, it could be turbid, um, could be cloudy. Um, glucose, we want negative. Um, if the glucose is present. Generally the um, blood glucose is above like 220, 200, 220-ish, because um, that just means the sugar is spilling over into the urine. Um, bilirubin, we want that negative. <clears throat> um, ketones, obviously we want negative. Um, when, um, when we do see ketones in the urine, uh, that is actually could be diabetes, um, mellitus, um, or like starvation or um, anorexia because the body is breaking down body fats um, into ketones and they're, they're being excreted in the urines. Um, well, that's another one here. Specific gravity we talked about. Um, blood. Um, we want that negative. But we may see it um, if we take a sample from a woman who is menstruating. Um, we also might see it in like a cath sample because there is a little bit of trauma when we do a catheter. Um, so we might see a little bit of that blood, like a trace like this one says. Um, pH, we talked about pH earlier. Um, protein, we want that negative. Um, when we see protein in the urine, um, we think um, problems with the glomerulus. Um, when we act, when we see proteinuria, there are renal problems. Um, if it's just intermittent, say we test and we see it this week, but we don't see it in two weeks, um, we can actually guess that it might be dehydration or a fever or even strenuous exercise. Um, but overall, we don't want to see protein in the urine. Urine, 
um, because that's another thing that should not be um, excreted through the kidneys. That should be absorbed. Um, urobilogen, we want that negative, or what do we want? 0.1 to 1. Um, nitrates. Nitrites. Nitrites are what we look for in um, for a UTI. Bacteria actually causes um, nitrates to be converted into nitrites. Um, so if there is a positive nitrate in a urinalysis, we're looking at a UTI um, because it means there's bacteria present. Um, leucoesterase um, is an enzyme that's found in white blood cells. So if that is positive, um, that is generally a positive for a UTI as well. Um, looking at kind of my notes here. So then white blood cells. If there are white blood cells in our urinalysis, again, um, we don't want any seen. We want that to be negative. But if there are white blood cells in our urinalysis, that is also a key thing that says, hey, there is a UTI. Um, epithelial cells, um, there can be some. Um, it's just skin cells. Um, bacteria, obviously, we want negative. Um, that's another red flag that says, hey, if there's bacteria in the urine, we need to really look for a UTI. Um, so if I had to look at this urinalysis, I would definitely say that this person um, has a UTI. So as you can see, um, number 20, um, it states, talks about uh, criteria for culture is met and a culture will be set up. Um, so what a culture is, is generally run as a urine culture and sensitivity, but it tells us the type of bacteria, the number of bacteria, um, which is what the culture part of it is, um, and the sensitivity part uh, tells us what antibiotic is going to kill that, uh, that bug, what antibiotic is going to work to clear up the UTI. So you're going to see urinalysis um, with CNS if criteria are met. Um, that's the type of order that you'll see. All right. So, what is our next test? Got a million PowerPoints up. Um, oh, one thing that I do want to stress is that we need to collect the urinal, urinalysis. Um, they'll take from the urinalysis and send for the culture and sensitivity. We don't need a separate urinalysis for that. Um, but if a person has, you know, 17 symptoms of a UTI um, and the doctor wants to start them on an antibiotic before we take the urinalysis, which is not very common, um, we need to get that urinalysis for culture and sensitivity before we administer their very first dose of antibiotics, whether it's oral, whether it's IV, it doesn't matter. We want to have that sent to lab and ran before um, we give them any antibiotics. Um, creatinine clearance, I'm not going to go to the other web page, um, but it measures the creatinine um, in the blood and the creatinine in um, the urine. Um, to see if they're the same, um, to see if, you know, there's more in the blood or there's more um, in the urine um, in a 24-hour time frame. So the person is going to take the jug home, keep it on ice, um, void and discard their first void of, like, say, Saturday morning. They'll void in the morning and flush it like normal. Any consequent void or urination um, after they've thrown away their first void in the morning on Saturday, they are going to put in this, uh, it's a big orange container, big orange-red container, um, 
for 24 hours. When they get up on Sunday morning, they're going to void right away in the morning, and they're going to dump that one into the orange or red container. So it has a, a very specific 24-hour collection time. Um, it can be very hard. A lot of people have to do it while they're in the hospital. Um, I have done it at home on my kids, um, but they did allow me to do it at home rather than having to have be in the hospital for it. Um, and they do that, um, but if they're like elderly or ha might have issues, they may have them stay in the hospital to do this. Um, note here, um, this is what is done to determine if dialysis is needed. Um, a 10% renal function is comparable to um, 10 mLs per minute, if that makes any sense. Um, anything under 10%, they need dialysis. So, we have covered, let me get back to the creatinine. I got my does mixed up. gone over protein, ketones, um, red blood cells, which is also blood, um, called hematuria, um, menses, um, maybe cancer, um, kidney stones can cause um, blood in the urine, trauma, infection can sometimes cause blood in the urine, um, yeah, white blood cells, cas, um, kind of when these pieces, contents, um, settle into molds or make abnormal shapes in the renal tubules, um, they can be seen when they're looking at the urine. I do have notes on casts. Um, it's just basically clumps of cells or material, um, and it kind of depends on what it is. If it's protein clumps, there's called a hyaline cast. Um, if it's cellular material, it's called a cellular cast, um, but we, we might see some hyaline casts, occasional. Um, yeah. All right. Okay, so. Hematuria just means blood in the urine. Um, and it really looks like cranberry juice in this picture. Um, hemoglobinuria or myoglobinuria um, is more this like coffee colored um, Pepsi, if you will. Um, The use or en a use um, or storage of muscle cells um, when there's breakdown of these muscle cells is when you're going to see um, this coffee colored urine, the myoglobinuria. Um, there might it might be caused by trauma, um, venom, malignant hyperthermia, like we talked about in perioperative. Um, but a big one that we will see this coffee colored urine. Um, is called rhabdomyolysis. Um, I can't remember if we talked about it or not. Um, but anytime there is breakdown of the muscle cells, um, a person is at risk for rhabdomyolysis. Um, this is like when an old lady falls on her floor and doesn't have anybody to check up on her. Um, and she lays there for 24 hours. Yeah, I think we did talk about this. Um, this is one of the symptoms, is this coffee-colored or Pepsi-colored urine. Um, generally, when skeletal muscles are injured, um, the CK, like we talked about, the CKMM, will be elevated um, as well, but this is what we're going to see. Um, I had a patient once who was kind of a stinker. He was a new admit. Um, he was admitted for falling at home, um, 
and he would sit in his chair at night and drink his Pepsi. Well, during the night, he decided he didn't want the rest of his Pepsi, and he wanted to spit in his bottle, like his Pepsi bottle. So what he would do is he would dump his Pepsi into the urinal because he knew the girls would go in and dump it eventually. Um, he was a, a, I can't remember if he was a one assist or a two assist, but anyways, he didn't get up on his own to go throw it away. Um, he didn't want to dump it into the sink because he couldn't get up by himself, so he would dump it into his urinal. Um, came in one morning, and I happened to be the first person in there, so I was talking to him, and he asked if I would dump his urinal. He didn't even know anything I would that I would think anything of it. I looked at it, and it literally looked like this picture. I about had a heart attack because I thought he had myoglobinuria and I was scared that he had gotten rhabdo from falling at home because this was like his second or third night there. It took me a little bit to figure out that he was dumping his Pepsi into his urinal, but um, this was um, the first sign that I, or first thing that I thought of. Um, why rhabdo is so um, worrisome is that this myoglobin um, can actually clog up um, the kidneys and clog in the tubules um, and cause the kidneys to fail. Um, so people really need to get on IV fluids and flush their system. Flush, 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 flush. Um, um, pyuria um, just means pus in the urine. Um, it can be caused by a UTI, and it literally looks like that. It, I have seen some terrible, terrible pyuria in my day, and it's thick, and it's... Ugh. Hmm. All right. So, creatinine. Make sure to make sure... I want you to be conscious that it is creatinine. I can't say it. Yeah, I make a terrible nurse. I can't say half these words. Um, it is I-N-I-N-E. Um, because there is a creatine. Um, but creatinine um, is a waste product of the creatine. You've heard people who are um, trying to gain muscle, um, increase their muscle mass. They take a creatine supplement um, so that their body has more energy to build those muscles. And it's not, their exercising isn't burning what they've already built up. So they take the creatine to, in, a, in addition to what their body is making so that they don't burn their muscles. Um, and this creatinine is the waste product of that creatine. I'm going to say it again. Um, it is a renal function test. Um, it will increase with damage to the nephron, but it is the best indicator of poor kidney function. Um, there is nothing else that will elevate the creatinine. Um, unlike other tests like the BUN and all of that, um, renal function um, is the only thing that will elevate a creatinine. The higher the level is, um, the worse the kidney function is. Um, the BUN is also used, but um, only in coordination with the creatinine. The BUN is never considered by itself to look for kidney function. Creatinine is done with a BUN or a BUN um, to look at that kidney function um, because BUN, and it's on the next slide, um, BUN will increase with dehydration. So we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but the creatinine is the best indicator for renal function. Um, they also do what's called a BUN and a creatinine ratio. Um, what do I want to say here? 
I don't know that there's a whole lot I want you to worry about with a BUN and creatinine ratio. Um, they just compare the two. Um, if they're both increased, if they're both decreased, if they're um, how far apart they are, um, those types of things. I do, however, want to go to our other website and pull up creatinine. See, there's lots of stuff on creatinine. Um, so, creatinine um, used with a BUN, um, part of a BMP or a CMP, you guys have heard that before. Um, BMP or CMP might be done um, in a routine physical exam or um, just an overall, hey, what's going on? Um, before surgery, um, they might do a renal panel. Um, let's see. Um, creatinine and bun tests are going to be done um, to see how the kidney function is before um, they're given dye. Um, what else? It's used to um, calculate the GFR, which we'll get into. Um, that's urine. So we're just going to go to what does the result mean. Real result means there's damage to or swelling of the blood vessels in the kidneys, which could be glomerular nephritis, um, infection, autoimmune disorders, um, there might be a, a bacterial infection in the kidneys, which is called pyelonephritis, um, tubular necrosis, um, kidney stones, um, reduced blood flow um, for any reason, um, like shock, dehydration, CHF, um, arthrosclerosis, um, or even diabetes. So it's really just looking at the function of the kidneys. So you guys can look at this. Um, like I said, this is an awesome site. I really, really like it. So here we go. Um, wow. Our BUN, uh, the blood urea nitrogen, um, waste product of protein metabolism um, that's excreted by the kidneys. Um, stressing again, it's not as sensitive as creatinine um, because different things um, like diet and hydration or dehydration can affect the BUN. Um, if the BUN is increased or elevated, and that creatinine is normal, meaning the kidneys are functioning normal. This is a sign of dehydration. Um, if the BUN is elevated and the creatinine is elevated, that is a sign of kidney failure. So um, just know that if the BUN is elevated and the creatinine is normal, that is a sign of dehydration. Um, the creatinine does not increase with dehydration. Um, you guys can look at the notes and stuff and see what the levels are affected by. Um, symptoms of um, an elevated BUN um, are things like a low urine output dehydration, um, confusion, change in level of consciousness, increased thirst. So you can see where dehydration would affect the BUN levels. Um, it's not the best indicator of kidney function, but it, it helps. It, it will suggest kidney problems. Um, and then uric acid. Um, uric acid is produced when we eat purines. Um, I think of it as the old bachelor diet. Um, it's beer, it's whiskey, it's um, smoked meats, it's um, pickled meats, like pickled herring, I think of. Um, just kind of those types of foods. Um, so generally, this uric acid um, carried to the kidneys, kidneys are going to get rid of it. Um, but when a person is unable to get rid of this uric acid, like I said before, 
it travels in the blood and it settles in the joints, most commonly the big toe. Um, so it can um, lead to gout. All right. Gamma ruler filtration rate. Um, this just tells us how well the kidneys are filtering um, the blood that comes through. So the blood pressure um, forces um, blood, plasma, the substances, proteins um, out of the glomeruli and into Bowman's capsules, and that's what's called the renal filtrate. Um, waste products like the urea and the ammonia um, will dissolve in that plasma that is pushed through the glomeruli and into Bowman's capsules um, and be part of the renal filtrate. Um, bigger proteins stay in the blood because they can't be forced out of the glomeruli. Um, so what the GFR is, it's um, the amount of the renal filtrate that is formed by the kidneys in one minute. Um, so average 100 to 125 mLs per minute. Um, so you can see where if we have a GFR of 10, that really tells us that we that our patient needs dialysis because it's not making enough filtrate and it's not taking enough of the toxins of the crap out of the body. Um, as blood flow increases, the GFR will increase. As blood flow decreases, um, the GFR will decrease. So. Um, it, you can, it really it will tell us on how much the person is urinating. Um, so if there's damage to the kidneys, like a trauma, then the GFR is going to slow down. Um, if they're hypovolemic or dehydrated, GFR is going to slow down. So just know that the GFR is a very good test um, that tells us how the kidneys are filtering. Um, yeah. Kidney disease, um, is generally, um, 60 or below, um, for three months. Um, well, that'll tell us that the person has chronic kidney disease. Um, GFR is calculated and their race, their gender, their age, their weight, all of that is taken into consideration. Um, for their GFR. Um, generally we want it above or equal to 90 mLs per minute, but we really want it up in the 100 to 125. What else? What else? Um, talked about 10, this 10 to 15 um, GFR will really tell us that there's kidney failure. 60 or below will tell us that there's kidney disease. There. You guys can look at that. Um, it's just basically the um, stage of kidney issues based on their GFR and what the actions are. All right. Oh, I don't have this one. Maybe I just have addition to it. It's just added to um, non-invasive uh, procedures when a blood is cancer. Who knows? Anyways, bladder scans are done. Um, back when I was a first day nurse, um, we didn't have bladder scans. Believe it or not, if we thought somebody was retaining urine, we just cast them. Yeah, that's how old I am. Um, now, if somebody states that they're feeling like they have pee and they can't go, um, or we feel bladder just dis bladder um, oh, distension, um, we're gonna go get the bladder scan. And if it reads, I know the book or somewhere I read said like 150 to 200, um, but I've never cast anybody um, less than four. Um, so it just kind of depends on what your facilities policy is, but I don't 
believe that I, I've never cast anybody because of risk for infection. But um, just know that if a person is retaining urine, complaints of bladder pain, um, we're going to do the bladder scan first. Um, they might do a CT scan. Um, or an MRI, it just kind of depends on what the um, the issue is. More times than not, they're going to do a CT with dye or an MRI with dye. One thing that we need to always remember before we give any of our patients dye, we need to know what their BUN and their creatinine levels are. Um, contrast dye is very, very, very nephrotoxic. Um, if they have any type of kidney disease, we cannot give them contrast dye. Um, so check your BUNs, check your creatinines before you give any contrast dye. Um, another thing we need to know about um, contrast dye is if they're diabetic and they're taking metformin. Um, there is a huge interaction with it. They need to be held before, they're, before they get the um, contrast dye and it needs to be held for 48 hours after they've received the dye because we need to give their body enough time to get rid of that. Their kidneys need to excrete it. We need to give them at least 48 hours. Um, you guys have heard of CTs and MRIs. You guys know that you need to take all the metal off for MRIs because of the magnetic force. Um, Yeah, I think you guys are good on that. Um, PUBs, kidney, ureter, bladder, x-ray. Um, this just looks at the kidneys, the ureters, the bladders on an x-ray. Um, looks for tumors, looks for if there's any swelling, um, any cysts, any abscesses, um, anything that they might think is malignant, any worry if there might be a, a, a met somewhere. Um, stones, any obstruction, infections, um, and then they're just going to look at the kidneys to see what their shape is, what their size is. Um, it's just basically kind of a, a preliminary study. Um, might need bowel prep, may not, just um, when they're worried that there's something going on with the blood or the kidneys or the ureters, um, they're going to do, do a KUB. Um, invasive things, um, the pilogram, um, I've never seen one of these done, um, and I don't exactly know a whole lot about them, um, but a pilogram is basically an x-ray exam of urinary tract, um, the patient's given a, like a contrast dye, it's going to go through their kidneys, their ureters, and their bladder, and Pictures are taken at different intervals um, to see how the kidneys, the readers, and the bladder are working. Um, they're going to watch that dye go through. Um, but we need to make sure that they're not allergic to iodine or shellfish. Um, we need to check um, their BUN and creatinine levels um, before they get contrast dye because we want to make sure their kidneys are able to get rid of it. Um, If they do have a mild kidney, um, poor kidney function, um, a lot of times they're going to be given extra fluids um, and muco mist um, to help get rid of the dye. Um, there should not be any bleeding um, with this test. If there is any type of bleeding, then we need to call the doctor right away. Um, and we're just going to encourage fluids once they're done um, to get rid of that contrast dye. Um, we're going to watch our urine output and make sure they're getting rid of all the fluids. Um, one thing with contrast dye, we are we need to teach our patients um, that they might have a um, this warm flushing sensation up the arms and sometimes throughout the whole body. Um, I've seen patients think they peed the bed um, when the dye started going through them. Um, literally thought that they wet themselves um, just because of that flushing. 
sensation. Yeah, this is what a pilogram looks like. I really suck at x-rays, so I'm not going to tell you what I see. Um, but you can basically see where the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladders are. All right, I am going to take a break because I'm starting to sound like a frog, um, and I'll be back in a minute. All right, I'm back. This would be so much easier if we could have class. All right, so types of incontinence. I want you guys to know these back and forth. Um, stress incontinence. Stress is um, like the dribbling. Um, when people sneeze, laugh, um, lift big things, cough, um, jog jump on a trampoline, um, you name it. A lot of times we'll see this after childbirth or even after menopause, um, but you hear people joke about, oh, I had, had so many kids, I can't sneeze without crossing my legs. This is stress incontinence. Um, it just, the pelvic muscles are weaker. Um, men, it could be um, they've had a prostatectomy um, or radiation to their prostate or their bladder um, so that when they they just dribble. It's less than 50 mLs a time. Um, so just remember that it's when they're sneezing, laughing, coughing, um, doing physical activities like jumping on a trampoline or jogging, um, they dribble a little bit. So this is one of the um, questions we will ask on a full head to toe. Do you have any issues with your um, bladder? Do you dribble when you cough or sneeze um, or laugh? Um, urge incontinence. This is the most common type of incontinence in elderly. Um, it's also called overactive bladder. Um, so a person gets this very strong urge to go to the bathroom and they can't make it to the bathroom in time and before they get to the bathroom they've peed. Um, it's a very um, scary thing. I know I have personal information, um, but after I had my, I think it was my second child, I was literally got up in the middle of the night. I had to pee, but I had to go get a drink of water first. I stood at the kitchen sink and the sound of the water, I had this terrible urge to pee and I couldn't even take a step because I just peed all over the floor right there. Um, so this is just when that bladder is overactive and you can't get to the toilet um, fast enough. Um, Kegels should um, help both of these types of incontinence. Um, you can teach your your patients um, the Kegel exercises. You know, practice bearing down, um, tighten up your muscles down there, um, squeeze your butt cheeks, um, those types of things to teach them how to do Kegels. Um, all right, um, functional incontinence. This is when it's different than urge um, in the fact that there isn't this terrible urge and you have to go right now. Functional incontinence is when someone is unable to get to the toilet because of a barrier. Um, whether they um, can't walk to the toilet on their own, um, maybe they're in a nursing home and they have to press a call light and the CNA or the nurse is busy in another room and they wait 10 minutes. Um, basically when these people are dependent on others, they put their call light on when they have to go to the bathroom, but they can't get there in time. Functional incontinence. A way to combat functional incontinence um, is to do that toileting schedule. Like I talked about earlier, um, it's every two hours, um, but I think the most common way to word a um, Toileting schedule is upon awakening, uh, before and after meals, upon bedtime, um, so that they are getting taken to the toilet on regular intervals. So they're not, you know, I have to go to the bathroom, waiting for someone to help them, and then being incontinent. So putting them on a toileting schedule will really help with functional incontinence. Um, overflow incontinence, when the bladder gets so full um, and it can't hold anymore, it's going to cause dribbling. Um,
basically the bladder is stretched so far that the body is telling it to empty. Oh. Sometimes people with spinal injuries can't tell that their bladder is full, so they'll have this overflowing continence. And then total incontinence, um, it's all the time. Um, unpredictable, it's continuous. Um, sometimes surgery or trauma um, will cause it. Bladder training, Kegels, none of that will work um, because it's generally like a neurological um, cause. It's our priority, our responsibility to keep um, these patients dry. Um, so, like I said, we, they're checking changes. Um, change every two hours. Make sure that their brief is dry so that they don't have um, any type of skin breakdown because that they are totally or completely incontinent. Um, on my notes, I do have that um, a condom cap in these cases may be used for male patients. Um, condom caps are really kind of not used very often, so people don't know a whole lot about them. Um, I did have a young male patient that used condom caps because they didn't want to do an indwelling cap because it was uncomfortable to wear a bag, and they didn't want to do intermittent cap because then he would need um, skilled people in their in his home, um, so he had um, I don't know patient PCTs I think they're called in home care um, that were not trained when it came to condom catheters, and he would literally tell his um, young pretty helpers um, that he needed to have an erection to put a condom catheter on. Um, this is not the case. They do not need to be erect to put the condom catheter on. Just I want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, it was a very sad situation. Um, but sometimes they will use them. I haven't seen one in, in, in quite a long time, but um, just know that they're out there and they don't need to be erected to be put on. So what's our responsibility? We need to determine what's causing the problem, what their signs and symptoms are. Um, they might have a UTI and cause some of these in incontinence issues. Um, they might have barriers, like maybe they can't get their pants down. Um, maybe it's somebody who's demented and they don't know how to unbutton their jeans anymore, so they need to be put in um, like jogging pants or you know comfy pants. Um, maybe they can't get to the bathroom in time, like functional incontinence. Um, so what do we do to fix the problem? Toileting schedule. Um, a new thing when I was working in nursing homes, it was encouraging their fluid intake during the day, and then at, um, I think it was 6 o'clock, I think was the normal time, um, to decrease how much water they were taking after 6 o'clock. Um, we're going to keep them clean and dry, um, just like we would our, our own children when they're in diapers. Um, these patients need to be kept clean and dry. Use um, A and D or um, desitin or zinc or something to keep them from breaking down because of their um, incontinences. One other big thing that we don't talk about a whole lot is the social aspect of being incontinent. Um, a lot of patients really tend to be socially isolated. Um, once they become incontinent, especially if they're home, um, they don't want to go out because they, they smell or maybe they don't know about the products they can use or something like that. So we need to make sure we're educating them on um, different different products they can use. And then here again is the Kegels. All right. Urinary retention. Um, can it, be, it can be acute um, or chronic. Um, basically, it is just their inability to empty the bladder entirely. Um, it could be 
that they can't start a stream. It could be that they can't fully empty their, empty their bladder. Um, so, um, acute cases, um, you're going to see that after anesthesia, um, maybe some meds, um, and sometimes when they have trauma um, to their genital urinary, urinary system. I've had patients, um, my last patient that I remember that really had urine retention um, that needed to be straight cathed uh, was an MS patient. So after she had, I can't remember if it was a hip or a knee done, um, she was very nervous that her MS was flaring and it was getting worse, uh, but it was actually just from the anesthesia. Um, things like enlarged prostate, diabetes, even pregnancy, um, some medications, strictures of the urinary system or an obstruction of the urinary system can cause this chronic um, retention. Generally, the acute is going to have a sudden onset, sudden onset, um, and there's not going to be any output. Um, can be a medical emergency um, if that bladder stretches, um, and they're at risk for um, bladder rupture. So if our patients, oh wait a minute, chronic um, urinary retention has a slower onset um, and they will, they might dribble a little bit more, um, but that's the difference. Acute is rapid onset, chronic is slow onset. So what we're going to do is we are going to palpate um, that bladder, see if it's distended, um, feel for a full bladder. Generally, we can't feel it, but if it's if it's distended and has, you know, a thousand cc's in it, we're going to be able to find it. Um, so then we are going to get the bladder scanner out, this wonderful tool that I didn't have when I first started. Um, it's basically, if you guys haven't seen it, it's a little, um, almost ultrasound-like type thing, um, placed above the bladder. You move it around with some gel, and it'll tell you how much urine is in the bladder. Um, catheters, like I've said, we need to um, really try not to use these if at all possible. So when I was starting out, we cast everybody that we thought had urinary retention. The um, number of UTIs we saw was a lot higher than it is now. Um, <coughs> most catheters, um, the stats here are 44% um, have an UTI um, and 90% who have an indwelling cath for 70, 17 days um, will have a UTI. Um, people with the indwelling U, um, catheters will generally be, have a chronic UTI that just really never goes away. Um, eventually they'll go septic one day, um, but it's because all the bugs crawl up the catheter. And, um, it can be, well, like I said, it can be um, bugs crawl up the catheter and up the urethra and into the bladder, um, or it can be if the bag becomes um, contaminated, bacteria grow in the drainage bag, and then for some reason the urine is drained back, following up that tube into the bladder. Intermittent catheterization um, or a straight cath is done um, for people who require frequent catheterizations. Um, they can do these at home. I've seen some some terrible practices with this. I had a lady who uh, was not sure why she always had a UTI, but that was because she stored the same catheter behind the, her faucet in her bathroom. Um, they still w may lead to a UTI, but the, usually the incidence of UTIs are a lot less with the straight caths. Um, 
anytime we are placing a indwelling or a fo or foley um, or even a straight cath, we never want to drain um, more than a thousand cc's out of it at a time. Think of it as a balloon. If we go in and we drain, you know, so maybe this person has um, 2,000 cc's. When we bladder scan them, that bladder scan, I haven't used the new ones a whole lot. I don't like them. Um, but the old ones, if it's more than 1,000 cc's in the bladder, it'll say greater than 999. Um, but if we're straight cathing or um, inserting a Foley catheter, we don't want to take out more than 1,000 because that bladder is like a balloon. If you let the air out too fast, it's going to shrink down very fast, which causes spasms in the bladder um, and can be very, very painful. So we're going to either pull out the um, straight cath or we're going to clamp the Foley cath and let them sit for a while, let their bladder rest, and then we're going to pull out some more. Um, Super pubic catheters are placed um, just above the symphysis pubis. Um, it's a surgically surgical incision. Um, the hole actually stays there. Um, and the catheter is inserted through this hole in the symphysis pubis straight into the bladder. It never goes um, into the vagina or the, the penis. It just goes straight through the stomach above the symphysis pubis. Um, inserted exactly like a Foley catheter. But people who will have chronic catheters generally opt for a superpubis. Um, UTIs caused by a catheter are called cauties, C-A-U-T-I's, um, catheter-associated urinary tract infection. Um, and decreasing the number of infections related the cauti infections um, is actually um, a national patient safety goal every hospital has um, guidelines and protocols that they need to follow to reduce the number of cauties <laughs> all right we're kind of moving along i think we're about halfway done a little less all right, so again on UTIs. Second most common bacterial infection um, and most common hospital acquired infection. Um, they're either a lower UTI or an upper UTI. The lower UTIs are going to be like urethritis, prostatitis, and cystitis. Um, and that goes up as far as the bladder. Upper UTIs are pyelonephritis and ureteritis, um, kidney infection and ureter infection. Um, hospital acquired is either called a nosocomial infection um, or it could be a community acquired. Um, generally, most common types of UTIs start at the urinary meatus and work up. Um, the most common bug that causes UTIs is E. coli. That's why we tell our female patients, wipe front to back, not back to front. Um, because if they're wiping back to front, they're introducing an E. coli, which lives in the rectum, um, into the vaginal area, and then it can climb up the, ure the urinary meatus and cause an infection caused by E. coli. So what are our symptoms? These are some of the most common things that I want you to be aware of when practicing. Um, I think UTI is the biggest thing I've dealt with, especially in the elderly. Um, common symptoms, dysuria, urgency, frequency, incontinence, um, nocturia, hematuria, back pain, cloudy, foul-smelling urine. Um, when a person complains that it burns when they pee, um, or they have to go a lot more than normal. 
um, maybe they're not able to hold their urine and it's almost like an urge incontinence. Um, maybe they don't usually get up at night to pee and they've been having to get up every hour to go to the bathroom. Um, their blood might be blood tinged, it might be cloudy, and it's going to um, have a very distinct foul smell. Um, a lot of times they might have um, stomach pain, um, like lower abdominal pain, um, or flank pain, like back where the kidneys are located. However, our elderly do not always present with the same symptoms. Um, sometimes their temp actually decreases. Um, they may have behavior changes, especially in like the demented patients. Um, they might be fully co cognitive or fully lucid, and all of a sudden they're not. They're confused. They're, um, you know, almost acting like overnight. They become so confused they almost like have dementia symptoms. Um, and a lot of times they're gonna ha they might have a decreased um, urine output. They might be fatigued as well. Um, so you can see where the elderly have um, these atypical symptoms compared to, you know, say a 30-year-old with a UTI. Um, in the nursing home, when a person had a change in level of consciousness or um, behavior changes um, or were more confused, um, the first thing we did was check a urine. So. Urethritis is the inflammation of urethra. Um, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, the biggest cause um, of urethritis is like irritants. Um, could be like an STI, uh, might be chemical or bacterial or even trauma, um, or even something as, you know, they wouldn't think, people wouldn't think of it as like bubble baths and bath salts, like Epsom salts. Um, especially like with little younger children, they like bubble baths. Well, it's not always the best thing for them. Um, hot tubs with the chemicals in it can also cause urethritis. To diagnose urethritis, um, they're going to get a urinalysis. Um, treatment is um, to remove the irritant, you know, don't give your children um, bubble baths anymore or to put them on an antibiotic to treat the bacteria. Um, they um, will also be told to wear cotton undies um, because it lets everything breathe down there rather than wearing their thongs. Not that your kids are wearing thongs, but I'm saying like the older people um, wear the cotton undies so that everything can breathe. Um, peridium. Um, or over the counter, it's called Eurostat. Um, it's basically an analgesic um, for the urinary system when there's problems urinating, the dysuria. Um, but make sure you're educating your patients that it can turn their urine orange and it can even um, stay in the contact lenses. Cystitis. Um, is inflammation and infection of the bladder wall. Um, so it's just the the infection is sitting on the um, superficial layer, the, the mucosa of the bladder. So the inner part of the bladder is going to be red, irritate, irritated, um, might actually bleed. Um, can be caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. Um, like I said, E. coli can actually ascend into the bladder. If it's a lower UTI, it's going to crawl up. Um, this is why we tell people when you have to pee, please go pee. Um, don't hold it. Don't wait um, because this voluntary urinary retention can also cause cystitis as well. Um, signs and symptoms are going to be dysuria and that foul smelling. Um, urine, urination is going to be painful or difficult. Um, they're going to have urge, um, like a sudden need to avoid, and they're going to be up at night going to the bathroom.
again, um, they're going to need a clean catch UA. Um, most times that it's going to, it's for cystitis that urine, urine will come back positive. Um, so treatments, it's going to be like things like Bactrim, Septra, um, Cipro, but they will have a culture and sensitivity to be sure that they're giving the right antibiotic. Things that we need to teach our, our patients, um, finish all med, all antibiotics, don't just stop taking them when you feel better, um, and really push the fluids, um, because the more you can flush and drink, the better. It'll flush everything out. And this is what a terrible, terrible cystitis looks like. All right, moving on up. Pyelonephritis, um, infection in the kidneys, the renal pelvis, the tubules, the interstitial tissue of one or both kidneys. Um, infection starts in the lower urinary tract and crawls on up. Um, sometimes the infection can start through the bloodstream um, and enter the kidneys, but more often than not, it's going to be start from the bottom and move its way up. Um, most common symptom of pyelonephritis um, is CVA tenderness, um, so that flank pain that I talked about, um, because you're going to feel the pain where the kidneys are. Um, pyelonephritis, these people are sicker um, than like with any other UTI um, because it's more of a systemic illness. Um, they can actually um, get septic real quick with pyelonephritis. Um, with pyelonephritis, things that we're going to do is we're going to treat that pain because pyelonephritis is painful. Um, we're going to, you know, I've seen people on like narcotics for, for pain, for their kidney pain. Um, again, we're going to encourage fluids or give them IV fluids to really flush the system and get those kidneys flushed out and get the bugs out of the kidneys. Um, and a lot of times these guys will, will not um, respond to oral antibiotics. antibiotics. So we're going to give them IV antibiotics. Yeah, and this is a kidney um, with pyelonephritis. Creatinasty. Um, if they have pyelonephritis, um, they're going to have a urinalysis, but we are also going to do blood cultures as well to make sure that they're not going septic. Um, in my notes. They might have a CBC run because uh, there will be elevated white blood cells um, and even a an increased sedimentation rate, a sed rate is what you hear it, um, because there's inflammation in the kidneys. Um, medications, it'll depend on what the culture and sensitivity says. Um, more times than not, these people are going to be hospitalized. and on IV antibiotics, and they're going to be given peridium um, because it's very painful when they urinate. Um, problems with pyelonephritis that aren't common with other um, UTIs, their kidneys can actually get damaged, Scarring, scar tissue, um, kidney function can actually decrease, um, and they can get septic. 
um, it's called urosepsis um, or septicemia, um, just because there is an infection in the body and with as much as the um, blood circulates through the kidneys, it can be transferred um, to a septic situation real quick. All right, so what's our role? We need to um, really educate our patients on prevention. Um, try and get them to drink two to three liters a day. Um, have them void every three hours. Have them urinate after intercourse. Um, avoid urinary irritants, cola, coffee, tea, alcohol, um, caffeine, those types of things irritate the urinary system. Um, cranberry juice or cranberry juice capsules, vitamin C, um, like I said, avoid bubble baths, um, feminine hygiene products, um, like douche and sprays and all of that, um, can actually cause pyelonephritis. Um, cotton underwear, like I said before, we don't want them wearing their thongs, we want them to wear cotton underwear so everything can breathe down there, um, and we want them to take all of their antibiotics, um, because after they're discharged from the hospital, they are going to be put on orals, and nine times out of ten, people say, oh, I feel better, so I quit taking them. No, you need to take all of them. Get rid of the whole infection. All right. We are moving on. I feel like I sound like a frog, though. <coughs> oh, I'm going to pause and just review my notes real quick. All right, let's get back started. Obstructions. Um, obstructions are any time there's interference with the flow of urine at any location in the urinary system. It can be caused by strictures, stones, tumors. Um, strictures could be like um, scar, tissue scarring. I can't talk. Um, so what happens is there's an obstruction, so the urine backs up, um, kind of blows up the kidney and the tubules, um, and all the renal tissues kind of atrophy. Um, the tissues thin out. Um, if you think of it, like the plumbing is plugged and it backs up, and it causes dilation further up, it'll cause that thinning of the tissue. Um, the blood flow to the kidneys is actually decreased, um, and the tissues actually die because they're ischemic. Um, Oh, that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you on this one. So strictures, urethral strictures. Um, in the urethra, it actually narrows, um, caused by like scar tissue. Can be caused from an injury. Um, can be caused like an infection, like an STI or trauma. Um, things like chlamydia and gonorrhea are huge um, causal factors for urethral strictures. Um, could be caused by an infection, um, like UTI infection if it's bad enough. Um, but injuries are basically where the injury occurred. Um, generally, it's caused by some sort of trauma, like um, if they have catheters inserted um, all the time, um, or surgical instruments. Um, another thing it talks about is like straddle injuries. thing that comes to mind is, say, um, a gymnast is on the beam and they crotch the beam. Um, that can actually cause a urethral stricture because it causes damage. Um, to that area. The stricture actually results um, in diminished urinary stream. Um, they're not able to empty their bladder. They are a huge risk for UTIs um, because the urine isn't able to come out and so it sits in the bladder and brews an infection. Um, elderly men, um, if they have problems with their prostate, this is really seen when we're trying to insert those catheters and you're going you're going to insert it and you can't get it in. Um, they actually make 
Coude catheters um, for this very reason. You if you insert them a little bit different, you go in and you twist because then you can get right around that prostate. Um, but the tip is curved and it's a little bit tougher than normal catheters just so it can get around these strictures or the prostate, whatever it might be. Um, treatment for strictures is basically, it sounds terrible, but a urologist will go in there and stretch that urethra. Um, and insert a catheter. Um, sometimes they can actually get what's called a urethroplasty where they go in and surgically um, open up that stricture. Renal calculi are other things that can form an obstruction. Um, ure ure urolithiasis is another word. Urolithiasis, there we go, um, is another word for renal calculi. Um, it's just basically stones that are formed somewhere in the kidney. Um, it's crystals and protein. Um, when that urine is super saturated with some sort of a salt that can form a solid. It needs a nucleus, some sort of substance to adhere to, um, and it'll collect around that substance. Um... Things that can be that nucleus are pus and blood, dead tissue, um, maybe even a catheter. I've seen some pretty nasty catheters come out. Um, and crystals can actually be that nucleus. Most of the kidney stones are caused um, or contain calcium oxalate or calcium phosph phosphate. Um, it can be combination stones too. Um, Etiology of calculi or um, urolithiasis um, might be family or genetics. Dehydration is a huge cause um, for stones. Infection. Um, dehydration more because the urine is more concentrated and it's got more, so it's got more of those salts in it, um, so they can really kind of bind together. Um, infection, because the infection, the bacteria and all that can cause um, more things to be like a nucleus and to build up. Um, some dietary factors can cause stones immobility because there's urinary stasis. Um, and urinary stasis itself can actually be a causal factor. Um, when somebody is immobile, the calcium will actually come out of their bones, um, enter the bloodstream, and then when it's um, filtered by the kidneys, it sits in the kidneys and can cause stones. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to teach them to restrict their protein and their sodium intake um, because that will really help in decreasing the incidence of stones. Um, yeah. So what are our symptoms going to be? They're going to have terrible, terrible, terrible flank pain that we need to treat. Um, we need to give them pain meds um, or put heat on um, their, their back, their lower back area. Um, anytime that somebody has a stone, it's going to be the worst pain they've ever had in their life. I have seen grown med curled over um, unable to even talk because the stones are so painful. Um, so we need to make sure we're treating their pain. Um, the pain can be in their back, can be radiate down to their genital area. Um, hematuria we might see um, because that stone is um, irritating the inside of that kidney. Um, they're going to have dysuria, it's going to be painful, um, they're going to be have frequency urgency um, of urination, we might see nausea and vomiting, whether that's 
Uh, yeah, this says right here on the slide. Because of the pain, because it's going to be so bad. Um, yeah, they're, like I said, they're, they're very, very, um, very, very painful. process to pass the stones. Generally, people can pass stones that are five millimeters or smaller. Not saying it's easy, but they can pass stones that are five millimeters or smaller. Um, we're going to either give them IV fluids or tell them to drink lots and lots of fluids so that we can try and flush the stones out of their system. Um, sometimes they'll be given meds, um, but if they are unable to pass them on their own. They're going to have to go in um, for lithotripsy where they go in and they break up the stones and then they pass the smaller stones. Whether or not they go in for lithotripsy, we have to strain every time they urinate. They're going to urinate into a hat, call us, and we're going to dump it through a strainer and make sure that see if they have passed any of the stones. Um, if they if they pass the stone, we're going to document it, um, some places even measure, um, but we're going to make sure we're straining all of their urine so that we know if they pass something or not. Our rule, we're going to do a urinalysis because we're going to double check for an infection. Um, like I said, we're going to encourage fluids or give IV fluids um, so that we're making them pee and diluting their urine um, so that they're not forming any more stones. Um, we're going to assess and medicate per pain. Um, might be IV morphine, might be um, the lauded, um, one of those very, very um, strong pain meds. We're going to encourage them to walk. Um, because sometimes that'll help pass the stone. Um, going to apply heat, um, especially if they're not able to get any pain meds at that time. Um, monitor vital signs because we're going to watch um, if they develop a fever, which means infection, or if their blood pressure drops and their pulse jumps, um, that pain could actually cause them to go into shock. Um, I, I and O we're going to do, um, and like I said, we're going to strain all of their urine um, through a strainer to see if they've passed anything. Uh, a lot of, the, and most of the time, we're going to send that stone to um, lab so that they can take a look at it. Oh, what else? Um, if they're unable to pass it, like I said, um, or if they're having so much pain. Um, they may go in for um, a lithotripsy or surgery, basically. Hydronephrosis, hydronephrosis um, is because the plumbing is um, plugged up. I told you that if it's plugged up and it can't be excreted, all that's going to back up into the kidney. Um, so instead of the kidney being the organ that filters everything, it's going to become basically a bladder. Um, it's going to damage that kidney real quick. So the biggest thing that needs to happen is that obstruction needs to um, be removed. Um, can be one side or both sides, um, just depending on where that obstruction is. All right, we are moving along now. Uh, cancer of the bladder. The bladder is the most common area of the urinary tract to. Let's say, the bladder of the bladder is the most common area of the urinary tract to have cancer. Ninety percent. Um, generally, more often than not, it's men that are 50 to 70 years old. 
um, because it can take quite a long time after some sort of an exposure um, to develop. So maybe 25 years. Um, cigarette smoke. Um, can be a huge cause for bladder cancer um, just because the the what's that? chemicals um, from the tobacco um, are absorbed into the bloodstream and then it, tra it goes through the blood and is filtered out through the kidneys um, and collected in the urine. Um, so then they sit in the bladder and those, that, those chemicals just kind of sit and go into the inside of the bladder, the, the mucosa, um, and damage the cells. Generally, the first symptom of um, bladder cancer is blood in the urine. But more times than not, the, the blood in the urine um, is ignored because it'll, it'll come and go. Um, treatment for bladder cancer is either chemo or that bladder can actually be removed um, and they can have a urostomy. Yeah, they, there's a lot of different ways they can. Um, all right. Um, they can start with a benign growth on the bladder wall and the changes in the cellular components um, go through reproduction and it starts altering, altering the cells and producing cancerous cells. Um, symptoms, like I said, it's painless intermittent hematuria. Um, because it comes and goes, the patient may ignore it. So, oh yeah, I had blood in my urine yesterday, but I'm okay today because it's not there. Um, eventually it'll progress to bright red blood. Um, their bladder will be, bladder will be irritable. Um, urinary retention, a lot of times because of the blood clots are blocking, um, the way out, um, and obstructing the urethra. They might, uh, form fistulas. Um, there might be an opening between the bladder going into the vagina or the bowel. Um, might have symptoms of a UTI. Um, and a lot of times bladder cancer is not discovered until they actually have severe pain or go into renal failure um, because of an obstruction and it's moving up. Generally, um, they're going to get a UA done. Um, they might have a um, biopsy done, um, or they might go in and actually look at the inner part of the bladder um, with a cystoscopy. Um, they might have uh, another thing where they're looking for an enzyme called telomerase. Like I said, I can't say half these words um, to detect bladder cancer. Um, Urine might be looked at, looking for cancer cells. Um, if somebody has um, bladder cancer, the most common sites for it to met to are um, the liver, the bones, and the lungs. I'm not exactly sure the rationale behind why it goes to those places. Um, but yeah, they, those are the common sites for metastasis. Interventions for bladder cancer um, might be chemo or surgery. Um, and it could be like a surgical diversion, like I talked about. Um, could be um, a ne neobladder could be a urostomy. Um, there's just different ways that they can go around 
actually having the urine sit in the bladder. So it's amazing what health can do now. Ooh, I think we're left with 20 slides now. All right, diabetic nephropathy. Um, diabetes affects every organ that our patients have. If you think of it, is they've got sugar molecules floating around in their bloodstream all the time because their body can't correctly deal with it. So if you look at the sugar molecule, it's very jagged, it's sharp. Um, so when it goes through the bloodstream and goes through the organs, it tears up the insides. Um, and especially in the kidneys. It goes through the kidneys and um, damages all those small blood vessels um, in there because the, these sugar molecules are just wreaking havoc in there. Um, the 15 to 20 years is the average time that it takes for a person to diabet or develop nephropathy. Um, but it really depends on how well controlled they keep their sugars. Um, somebody who has very uncontrolled sugars and their sugars are four or five hundreds, they're going to see nephropathy a lot quicker than somebody who keeps their sugar at a hundred. Um, what do I want to tell you? Um, the osmotic pressure in the blood vessels also um, increases because of hyperglycemia. Um, they're secreting or they're urinating more and having a diuresis, you know, all the symptoms of high blood sugars. Um, so that's another way that they damage the small blood vessels. Oh, my daughter's still up. Hold on one second. All right, I'm going to try and explain this to you, but it's really hard to explain this to a computer screen. Um, so in diabetic ne nephropathy, the blood supply to the kidney is decreased. When that happens, um, the capillaries... Um, thicken, um, like the walls of the glomerular capillaries. Um, when this happens, it doesn't absorb the protein like it should. So the protein actually leaks into the urine when the body needs it um, for fun to function. Um, so the body is getting rid of um, all this urine and it's, it's diluted that protein is following with all this fluid um, in urine output. Now the body, I don't know if you guys um, have ever been taught, um, but the body needs protein. When it loses protein, um, edema develops. Um, because that protein is either leaking into the urine or leaking into the tissues. So the fluid is building up in areas where this protein is leaking out. If that makes any sense. Um, so when they lose all this protein, the albumin in the blood also decreases, which causes this edema. Um, when people are losing three and a half grams of um, protein a day, there is massive, massive edema um, in the kidneys, in the legs, you name it, because that albumin um, doesn't control where that fluid sits. I hope that makes sense. If not, set up a Zoom with me and we'll go through it. Um, but when the fluids are going into the wrong places, this also puts them at risk for, for heart disease, um, um, cardiovascular disease, 
um, because that protein is not being kept in the body and it's being spilled out through the urine. All right. So symptoms, um, they're going to have low albumin levels, um, protein in their urine when they have high blood pressure um, because they've got cardiovascular damage because of diabetes. Um, this is going to cause that damage to increase. Um, it's going to make it go quicker, especially because um, the blood is flowing through it at a higher like their blood pressure is higher. So anytime that needs to go through any sort of capillaries or whatever, um, the, the damage is going to quickly happen. Um, output is going to decrease um, because the kidneys aren't going to be functioning like they should. And then that waste is all going to accumulate um, in the body. And it's either, either going to cause chronic kidney disease or it's going to cause renal failure. Um, diagnostics, um, they're going to do a urinalysis and they're going to really be watching for the protein. Um, they're going to be doing a creatinine, blood creatinine. They're going to do a 24-hour creatinine clearance. Um, they're going to be monitoring the albumin level, the protein levels. Um, If the blood pressure and the glucose levels are controlled, it will really slow the damage. Um, like I said, if somebody with a blood sugar that is commonly four or five hundreds compared to someone who keeps their blood sugar at a hundred, there's going to be a lot more problems at four or five hundred than there is going to be at a hundred. So um, controlling that glucose is really important. Um, the more sugar molecules in that blood, the damage is going to happen quicker. And blood pressure, the same thing. Um, the force that the blood is going through the, through the vascular system is going to really cause more havoc. Um, treatments, we're going to see ACE inhibitors um, or ARBs um, to really try to protect that GFR. Um, slow down the blood pressure. Um, try and help with holding onto that protein, uh, the albumin, um, so that the damage doesn't happen so quickly. Eventually these people are going to need dialysis and maybe even a kidney and a pancreas, kidney or a pancreas transplant. Um, but because diabetes is so hard on the kidneys, a lot of times you will see most of your dialysis patients are diabetics. Like I said, if you guys have questions on that, please, please contact me because I feel like I'm trying to explain it to a black and white screen. So um, so one thing I really miss about teaching you guys in person or even in a Zoom meeting, um, I just feel like I'm talking to a computer. All right, nephrotic syndrome. Like I said before, um, albumin is needed to control the fluid. Um, so when the body is excreting so much um, protein each day, this edema is going to de develop, um, causing pyelonephritis, causing renal scarring. Um, nephrotic syndrome may accompany glomerulonephritis, which is our next slide, um, and any other condition that develops from or affects the, fil the kidney filtering function. Um, nephrotic syndrome is when um, you're doing a urinalysis and those protein levels are high because that person is just flushing all the protein out of their system. Um, so their, their protein levels, their albumin levels in the blood are going to be high or low. Um, their cholesterol is going to be high and they're going to have edema, um, whether it's in the eyelids, the feet, the belly, um, you name it. But because they don't have that protein in their system, they're going to have terrible edema. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to decrease their protein intake um, because the kidneys can't, um, can't filter it. Um, we're going to decrease their sodium intake um, because that will help with their edema. 
or their ascites, which is the, the fluid in the belly. Um, and we're going to have to see what the under, other underlying disorders are. Um, they might need diuretics. Um, they might need immunosuppressives, um, which will, like prednisone, um, which will cause them to be at a high risk for infections. Um, and might need to be on anticoagulants. So, yeah, it's a, it's a scary, scary situation. So basically, diabetic nephropathy is almost the same thing as nephrotic syndrome because of the protein. Um, but nephrotic syndrome, you don't have to be diabetic. All right, glomerulonephritis. Um, this is just the inflammatory um, process of the glomerulus, which is the filtering unit of the kidney. Um, there's antigen antibody compl complexes um, in the basement membrane that are um, that just kind of depo deposit in that basement membrane. Um, when there's an infection and it's um, crawling around the blood bloodstream. It becomes filtered out in the kidneys, and then it kind of hangs out in the glomerular membrane, um, which causes the body to start the inflammatory response. <clears throat> um, the glomerulus, now that it has the inflammatory response going on, it cannot filter like it should. Um, so again, the protein, the white blood cells, and the red blood cells are all going to leak into um, the urine. So I hope that hope that makes sense. Um, before glomerulonephritis, generally um, there's a viral infection. The most common um, infection that happens before glomerulonephritis is um, a group A strep. Um, so like strep throat or, you know, something like that. Maybe a strep infection in the skin. Um, but there is gen there is always a, um, a viral infection <coughs> prior to this. Um, there's an abrupt onset. Um, they might require acute um, dialysis. Um, but it can also damage the kidneys. So if you have a patient who um, has a respiratory infection, um, we need to really monitor them in like a week, um, monitor their kidney function. And that is glomerulonephritis. Chronic. Um, so our patients that have chronic glomerulonephritis, um, a big thing, like I said, um, if they have strep throat um, or a respiratory infection, we need to treat that right away. Um, because if they are prone to gl chronic glomerulonephritis, that group A strep, strep throat, could move right into their kidneys. Um, sometimes it's going to be caused by an autoimmune response, um, like lupus. Um, sometimes it can be caused by drugs or toxins or vascular disorders. Um, sometimes insulin-dependent diabetes. Um, but the most common cause is the group A strep. Um, so we need to make sure that we're treating our patients for strep. Symptoms, because they're getting rid of all their protein, they're gonna have, they're gonna look like they're fluid overloaded. <coughs> um, they're gonna have periorbital edema um, around their eyes. They're gonna have ascites, which is fluid in their belly. Um, they're going to have pleural effusions because there's going to be fluid in their lungs. Um, flank pain because their kidneys are going to be 
edematist, um, their BUN and their creatinine are going to be elevated. Um, and then we're going to see that smoky brown or cola colored or coffee colored urine. Um, it's either going to resolve on its own or it's going to move to renal failure. Um, so what do we need to do? We need to treat the symptoms and the cause. Um, they're going to get diuretics um, to treat the fluid um, retention um, and the sodium. <laughs> We're going to decrease their sodium intake and their fluid intake because the more salt they take in, the more fluid they're going to retain. Um, we're going to restrict their protein. I know it sounds backwards, but their protein is just being excreted and that causes um, their albumin levels to drop and be full of edema. Um, we're going to give them ACE inhibitors because they protect the kidneys. Um, honestly, I wish I need to look up and find out what the scientific science is behind it. But always remember that ACE inhibitors protect the protein. Or protect the kidneys. Um, they'll also help um, decrease protein loss. Um, antibiotics will be given, especially since it's m caused a lot by the streptococcal infection. Um, if there's a lot of um, fluid overload, they might be started on dialysis to take take that fluid off for them. Um, yeah. That, in a nutshell, is glomerulonephritis. Sorry, it's 2 o'clock and I'm stuttering over my words. Oh, I don't have this slide. No thanks. Um, polycystic kidney disease. Um, it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, there's cysts that develop. Um, they're filled in, filled with fluid um, in the nephrons of the kidneys, um, and it can actually cause a huge enlargement of the kidney. Those are that's a picture of um, one in the middle is a normal kidney. <laughs> All right, acute kidney injury. Um, this is just a sudden loss. Um, the kidneys aren't able to clear waste products um, and manage that fluid electrolyte balance. Um, can happen in hours to days. Um, and generally it's seen they lose 85 to 90% of kidney function. So these, uh, um, these people you're going to see a rapid increase or an accumulation of the toxic waste that the kidneys would normally get rid of. Um, if it's caught early enough, it can be reversible. Uh, otherwise, it can actually lead to chronic kidney disease. So acute kidney injury can lead to chronic kidney disease. Um, here is my rule of thumb. I didn't even see this slide earlier. But when um, there's a urine output of less than 30 mLs per hour or 400 mLs in a 24-hour period, then we consider acute kidney injury. It might be surgery, it might be, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like trauma to the kidney. It just has to be something that causes the kidneys to not be able to clear the waste products of the body. Um, generally it could be like hypotension that causes it. There's not enough blood flow so it's not filtering what it needs to. Um, dehydration, um, could be obstruction in the vascular system, glomerular diseases, um, tubular necrosis, um, which is what happens when they can't handle the contrast media or maybe they um, had a very bad reaction for the, the first time they got contrast dye. Um, treatment, fix the cause, give them dialysis, um, and then prevent any complications. Um, the causes might be heart failure, 
sepsis, yeah, rhabdomyolysis are a few of the possible causes. <laughs> I don't expect you guys to know these. This is just kind of an FYI slide. You guys can look at it. Um, causes of acute renal failure or acute kidney injury. Um, it just kind of depends on where the injury is, pre-renal, intra-renal, or post-renal. So before the kidneys, in the kidney, after the kidneys. Um, chronic kidney disease basically is the, what the heck, did I miss this slide when I wasn't paying attention? Oh. All right, symptoms of chronic kidney disease. Well, I think I want to go back. Uh, chronic kidney disease, a progressive irreversible deterioration in kidney function um, the body is unable to maintain any metabolic, any fluid, and electrolyte balances. Um, it's not something that happens in days to hours, or hours to days. Um, it's something that is over time. It's a gradual um, decrease of function. Um, generally, we're going to see those waste products kind of build up in the bloodstream, um, and it affects every system in the body. Diabetes and hypertension are two of the biggest um, factors for chronic kidney disease. Um, nephrons will die off. Um, the ones that aren't damaged increase their work and eventually the, those will be working so hard they will be damaged as well. All right, so here we are. Symptoms of CKD are edema or fluid accumulation. Um, generally we'll see it in the extremities, in the sacral area, um, the belly. Um, we're gonna see it in the lungs. Um, so they're gonna be short of breath, they're gonna have crackles, wheezes. Um, they're gonna have hypertension <laughs> um, a lot of times they're not going to be urinating as much as um, they normally would. Um, either oliguria or anuria. Um, sodium um, might be low. They might have hyponatremia. Um, Hyperkalemia, um, because they're going to have elevated potassium level because um, the kidneys can't get rid of the potassium. Symptoms of hyperkalemia, muscle weakness, abdominal cramping, um, diarrhea. <laughs> We're going to give them k -exalate. Um Could be an enema, could be PO. Um, just because that's going to decrease those potassium levels. It'll bind with the potassium and have them excrete it. Hold on. Sorry, my daughter's trying to put the dog to sleep and is singing to me. Um, okay, x will be given. Like I said, it binds to the potassium and it excreted. Um, in the stool. Um, we need to teach our patients to avoid um, foods high in potassium um, and avoid like Mrs. Dash or whatever it's called because that's it's not high in sodium which everybody knows because it's a salt substitute but it's high in potassium. <coughs> um, so our interventions I apologize because my slides are different. 
Um, we want them to have a diet high in calories um, because we want them to take in as many calories as possible. But we want to have a low protein level um, to limit the nitrogen intake. But somebody who's on dialysis, because um, when they're taking dialysis, the protein is lost. Um, so it just kind of depends on if they're dialysis or not. Um, sodium restricted, um, because we want their sodium levels to be lower, um, because it causes fluid retention. Remember, salt follows water, or water follows salt. Potassium, we don't. We want a low potassium intake. Kidneys cannot excrete um, the potassium. Um, calcium is increased because remember I talked about the vitamin D and the calcitriol. Well, if the kidneys aren't functioning, they're not absorbing the calcium like they should because of they're not um, activating the vitamin D into calcitriol. Um, phosphorus is restricted, um, so they will actually be on phosphorus binders. Um, fluids are restricted because they want to prevent overload. Um, and most patients are given things like iron, folic acid, vitamins, and minerals um, because their diet is so restricted. Um, meds that we're going to see in CKD, um, diuretics, um, if they have a kidney function, um, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, um, like I said, they need antihypertensives that are also um, protective to the kidneys. Um, they're going to be on phosphate binders, like I said, because um, they need to reduce, make sure their phosphate levels are low. They're going to require less insulin. Um, they're going to be on calcium and vitamin D because they need those calcium levels up um, so they're not getting fractures um, and making sure their heart's working appropriately. Um, and they're not going to need as much um, insulin uh, because the, body's, the kidneys can't break it down and excrete it so it stays in the body longer. So I know... Um, I have different slides um, than you guys, and you're missing out on some of it. CKD is such a huge, huge, um, wide topic that I could talk on it for hours. I, I'm really trying to just hit the, the the things that you guys need to know. I like you should see my notes; they're all over the place. And I can't believe I made it through this lecture. But I did want to talk about um, dialysis. Um, there's two types. There's peritoneal and there's hemodialysis. When we um, have our patients come to the hospital, they're hooked up to a big machine, that's hemodialysis. Um, they start dialysis basically when they start building up fluid. When there's a huge severe <coughs> fluid overload um, because there's we're seeing high potassium levels they're acidotic they're they might have pericarditis they're vomiting they're lethargic um, or they might have uremia and all this is life-threatening so that's when they start um, dialysis <coughs> peritoneal it's peritoneal or hemodialysis I can't remember if I said that yet or not um, but basically Dialysis is the movement of particles from an area of high concentration um, to an area of low concentration um, through a semipermeable membrane. Um, in hemodialysis, this is how they clean the blood. Um, the blood is removed, gone through the machine, through the semipermeable membrane, and replaced back into the body. Um, People are, um, an AV fistula is placed for the most part for like long-term dialysis. Um, and these are when you're going to see them basically in their arms. I shouldn't say basically, but in their arms. Um, it's a surgically thing where there's an arterial venous fistula. So the artery and the vein are, are kind of in this, are kind of brought together. 
I'm trying to go through, just pick what I want you guys to know. Uh, when you feel if an AV fistula, you're going to feel it kind of flutter. It's, that's called a thrill. And then when you take your stethoscope and listen to it, you're going to hear what's called a brewy. It's going to swish. You're going to hear it swish, swish, swish. Um, if you ever have somebody that you're taking care of that is getting hemodialysis, you need to monitor this AV fistula and make sure that it is still um, patent, that it's still working appropriately. Even if you're not the one doing the um, dialysis, it is your job to monitor these things on a daily basis. Um, even if you're working in a nursing home, um, these are need to be monitored closely because if that AV fistula um, blocks up and is no longer usable, they cannot get their dialysis. Um, complications of hemodialysis, things like hypotension, um, generally is seen when they take too much fluid off. They kind of do all their, their calculations, and I don't know what's involved in determining how much fluid they're taking off. Um, I know their blood pressure and this and that is all taken into consideration. They determine what they um, take off and whatnot. Um, but you can see hypotension, um, bleeding. Um, generally, they use heparin during dialysis. Um, or they are very high risk for infection because um, their immune system is suppressed and they have damage to their white blood cells. Um, yeah. Peritoneal dialysis is generally done at home. Um, these patients know how to hook themselves up. They're very educated on everything that um, can go wrong, how to set everything up, what care needs to be done, how they need to do anything and everything. It um, has a, a very high infection risk. So that's why everybody is educated um, so much on it. There's a catheter that um, they hook up the machine to their, it's in their belly. Um, it goes in um, into their peritoneal space. The fluid sits in there, it fills, it dwells, and it drains. Um, so if you ever have to set one of these up, and believe me, I worked in a nursing home and I thought, oh, I'll never have to set peritoneal dialysis up. Oh, I do home care, I'll never have to set peritoneal dialysis up. Well, I was wrong. I've done peritoneal dialysis in both places, <clears throat> and I was not prepared for it. Um, so if you ever hear somebody who has peritoneal dialysis, please, please, please go check it out because it is so interesting. I'm not even a kidney person, um, and two of my favorite patients took peritoneal dialysis. Um, so anyways, they hook it up um, to the catheter. Um, the fluid fills. It sits in the stomach, and the peritoneal um, space dwells. So that's where the um, area of a higher concentration through the semipermeal membrane into the area of lower concentration comes into play. And then it's drained. Um, there's a machine that cycles. Generally, the person does it while they're sleeping because um, it takes several hours. Um, it is drained into like a big, huge IV bag and then discarded in the toilet. Um, it can be done... Um, up to three or four times a day. It can be continuous. It can be overnight. It just kind of depends on what their regimen is. Um, it is a sterile technique. Anytime you're accessing that catheter, you need to have a mask on and you need to use sterile gloves. Um, there's less dietary restrictions for peritoneal dialysis, um, but, but there's a lot more risk for peritonitis. Um, peritonitis is any time that a bug crawls into that peritoneal space and it is a life-threatening complication. One of my first home care patients was a kid about my age. And I, how old was I when I did home care? Oh, I was probably 30. Um, but, uh, I was scared to death. He, um... I took him over from another nurse, and she said, this is my medical miracle. Don't screw it up. Oh, gee, thanks. Um, he had literally, and they don't know what caused it, but he did peritoneal dialysis at home. The fluids filled into his stomach, and during dwell time, they turned into glass. 
and when he moved, that uh, that fluid actually shattered like glass. Um, and I I don't know how this kid survived it. The doctors don't know. Um, he was just a medical miracle. She was not um, she was not joking. Um, so there are some strange complications with peritoneal dialysis, but it's a lot easier on the patient. They can do it at home while they sleep where they don't actually have to go into dialysis, get up at 5 in the morning, show up there by 5.15. Um, and it's very interesting. So like I said, if you ever get a chance to see it, it's really kind of cool. All right, I think we made it through. It is now quarter after two. My daughter is still awake. So I'm going to try and load this to Camtasia, snuggle with her, get her to sleep, and then I'll load it from Camtasia to YouTube. Um, but as always, if you guys have any questions, get a hold of me, let me know. Um, I do want to pull up this website again real quick. The website for the lab test is just labtestonline.org. It is an awesome, awesome, awesome site when you're learning your labs or when you're on clinical. Um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Um, please use it. It will help a lot. But other than that, I'm going to go snuggle with my kiddo and try and get her to sleep, and then I'll load this up to YouTube as soon as it loads to Camtasia. All right, have a good night, guys. Oh, I hit the wrong button.